दिसंबर में डू है शायद नियरिंग फोर्टी रुपए कम थर्टी प्लस थर्टी फाइव रुपए को हेलो हाय समित सर देर इज अ प्रॉब्लम माय कैमरा इज नॉट गेटिंग कनेक्टेड ओह कैन यू सेंड द प्रेजेंटेशन टू मी हाउ यू कांट सी आल्सो इट्स नॉट कनेक्टिंग कैन यू सी माय स्क्रीन नो आई एम नॉट एबल टू सी now i'm sharing now can you see the screen i'll see yes i can see fine then i'll i can start without the my face because as it is my face is not so smart okay we can start with the uh, this thing uh, with the presentation straight away because i don't know why but my like, computer is not my uh, video is not working Ah, uh, you can put it on uh, slide show. Yeah, it is on slide show. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. everything is fine. No problem. Uh, are you able to see your slides? No. Yes, I am able to see my slides, but my video is not starting. I don't know why. Okay. You have anything else to show apart from the slides? No, nothing else. Not not like eye moments thing. No. No, no, nothing like that. Then it will be perfect. I think it's okay now. Yes, I think it should run. Right, right. That's nice. So, can we uh, start after two minutes? I am just mm -hmm. in the process of finishing my lunch. Yes, yes, yes. You, you start. We can start after two minutes. And uh, no, the Mycenae gravis is a very important topic for all the residents. And uh, Dr. Sumit Singh is going to take us through the critical care management, and uh, that's going to be very, very interesting because. Uh, look at the sufferings of my senior gravis patients uh, their uh, breathing problems and uh, their uh, what do you say all that helplessness and it, it's often we we slowly used to that the thing that the main aim of uh, my senior gravis treatment is a long term remission which are aiming and that long term remission uh, can be achieved Uh, various uh, methods, and uh, most important, if you are asked, as on today, 4th September 2020, what is your goal in the management of myasthenia gravis? Then the one answer that strikes is thymectomy. So thymectomy is the one which is ultimately will help in long-term remission, 
there are other methods there are new developments that are coming in place so what are treatments we use we use for symptomatic uh, relief all the pyridostigmines neostigmines and uh, we need to do atrophonium test and neostigmine test and we have to become well versed all the students with the fatigue testing which has the four respiratory parameters like uh, respiratory rate breath holding time single breath count chest expansion the arm flaps the sit ups the arm abduction time the ptosis time and all these things are done in that serial order before the neostigmine test and afterwards so all these things are very very important as a neurology resident whether you are in dm you are in md or you are a faculty you have to know the correct way of interpreting doing interpreting the fatigue testing and that's that's very very crucial then you have to plan your management what am i going to do and what are nuances of uh, the remission that is going to be introduced and uh, all these topics will be discussed at length and uh, Uh, i request all of you to interact and you can put your questions on chat so we can address them and it's go it's if you fun if you are uh, it is interactive session that's what we want the session to be more of interactive oh, I'm, nature i'm i'm ready whenever you are sir now oh, yes yes now i that sumit is ready and uh, i hand over the uh, the proceedings to dr sumit singh and whom you all know and he is our uh, Uh, director of neurology at Agrem Institute and Artemis Hospital Gurugram and ex Amsonian or uh, batchmate and uh, Dr. Sumit, you can uh, take it forward. Uh, my senior gravis diagnosis okay. and critical care management. All right. So um, my senior has been uh, uh, very very close to me. So I might overshoot in terms of my time. It's a very uh, important topic both for the theory. as well as for the practical aspects of neurology and neurosciences so we will start with the the anatomy of the neuromuscular junction so this is the end of uh, the nerve and this is the beginning of the muscle so here at the motor end plate which is this entire uh, uh, diagram there are certain vesicles of acetylcholine which you will be able to see here and then you can see that the end plate of the muscle is folded into a synaptic folds so that the total surface area of the neuromuscular junction is much much more than the actual surface area of that size of the muscle and at the end of uh, the neuromuscular junction there is what we call as the nerve terminal and these are the acetylcholine vesicles so as the signal it arrives from the brain and it reaches the nerve ending there is opening up of uh, the calcium channels and these calcium channels which are uh, opened up and it is a atp dependent uh, opening up of these channels the acetylcholine vesicles they tend to bind with the end of the nerve terminal and that releases the acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction now this acetylcholine binds with the acetylcholine receptors and opens up the sodium channels at the end plate of the muscle the remaining acetylcholine is destroyed by acetylcholine esterase enzyme and choline is formed which is actively reuptaken by the nerve ending and it goes into this cycle where acetylcholine is formed when choline acyl transferase and coenzyme a it joins with choline to form acetylcholine now this receptor which is basically the acetylcholine receptor when it opens up these sodium channels there is a influx of sodium and that causes the action potential above and above the end plate potential and that causes the mitigation of the excitation contraction coupling and this causes the muscle to contract so basically this impulse which is coming right from the brain and into the nerve uh, terminal does not go into the muscle directly and it has to skip this distance which is a physical distance of about uh, 
50 micrometers. So this is a 50 to 100 nanometer gap, which is the size of you can of each uh, acetylcholine vesicle if you see here. So this is a very small gap, but this is definitely a physical gap. So therefore, uh, any impulse from the brain does not go into the muscle directly, and it has to pass through this junction. Now, what happens in myasthenia gravis, uh, if we think and look at the pathophysiology, then there is production of anti-estalcholine receptor antibodies, which are seen in 80 to 85% of myasthenia patients. And in this, in patients with myasthenia, there is a reduction of the estalcholine receptors by three different mechanisms. There is a complement mediated damage to the postsynaptic membrane. There is an accelerated turnover of these estalcholine receptors. There is blockage of the active sites where the estalcholine can bind. And also there is atrophy of these folded reti ridges in the muscle end plate. In about 10% of patients, uh, this estalcholine receptor antibodies will not be seen and anti-musk antibodies will be seen. And then there would be uh, double seronegative patients in which there would still be myasthenia gravis, but these patients would neither have estalcholine receptor antibodies, neither they would have anti-musk antibodies. And these patients would still have some sort of autoimmune process which is going on, but we are as yet not knowing about them. So there are certain antibodies like anti-titan antibodies, anti-agrin antibodies, which are being evaluated currently to look into these seronegative patients as a group. These antibodies are IgG and are T-cell dependent, and hence the immunotherapeutic strategies against T-cells are effective in the treatment of myasthenia. Thymus is supposedly playing an important role in uh, myasthenia gravis causation and are about 70% of patients would have lymphoid follicular hyperplasia and about 10% would have thymoma. Hyperplastic thymus uh, glands have T cells, B cells and plasma cells and in the fetal thymic tissue, myoid cells which resemble the muscle that express the acetylcholine receptors have been found and probably that is what initiates the autoantibodies formation in certain patients because of trigger by some as yet unknown antigen. Now, disorders at the neuromuscular junction could be several. Uh, so they could be postsynaptic like myasthenia gravis, congenital myasthenia gravis, neonatal myasthenia, juvenile myasthenia. There could be synaptic disorders like botulinum toxin, and then there could be presynaptic disorders like lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. So for the present communication, we will not go here. We will very briefly touch probably these, but we will focus predominantly on myasthenia gravis. Though there would be two components of myasthenia. One would be ocular, where the disease is limited to the eyes, and then there would be a generalized myasthenia. We will also touch briefly about musk positive myasthenic syndromes. So this is the external presentation of a classical patient with myasthenia. There is a classification which is available where group one is ocular myasthenia, group two A is mild generalized myasthenia, group two B is moderate generalized myasthenia, acute severe myasthenia and late severe myasthenia. So myasthenia gravis, if we look at, is the most common disorder of the neuromuscular transmission, which was first described in 1672. And if we break this particular name into two, then we come with myasthenia gravis. So it is a severe weakness of the muscle uh, if we look at it in its literal meaning. So these patients, whatever their symptoms might be, would be presenting with fluctuating weakness, which is increased by exertion. The weakness increases during the day and improves with rest. About 50% uh, of the patients would have an initial presentation with ptosis, but during the course of the disease, about 90% would have ptosis at some time during their presentation. The head extension and the flexion muscles, the head extensors and the flexors are weak. It is usually that the flexors are weaker, but sometimes the extensors can be weak. It is very difficult to have isolated extensor muscle weakness in myasthenics. And if we find extensor muscle weakness, then we should think 
of musk positive myasthenia in these patients so the disease progression is very very variable sometimes it might remain restricted to the eyes only sometimes it might extend to the neck sometimes to the bulbar and the limb musculature and in about 16% it will remain stay to the ocular muscles only spontaneous remissions are extremely rare but and most remissions occur with treatment and if they happen they usually happen in the first 3 to 4 years clinically uh, they would have uh, weakness of any of the musculature so it could be ocular facial bulbar limb or respiratory Uh, now let us start with one by one let us start with ocular myasthenia it causes an asymmetrical weakness of several muscles in both the eyes classically the pupillary responses are absolutely normal it has been found that medial rectus is more frequently and more severely affected than others ptosis is usually asymmetrical and it varies during sustained activity so that is uh, what i often see that an mri is done in these patients of the brain considering that this is a ocular or uh, ophthalmic nerve or a ocular motor nerve problem now if we find ptosis then fluctuating ptosis and a ptosis which changes its site it changes its side and it changes its severity can practically never be because of ocular motor nerve weakness it is almost going to be always myasthenia then if you find that a patient has facial muscle weakness and a ptosis and ocular motor weakness then practically there is nothing else in clinical neurology which can present with this type of a syndrome where facial and ocular motor nerves are affected simultaneously to compensate for ptosis there is a constant uh, contraction of the frontalis muscle which gives a worried or a surprised look so if you look here then the frontalis is getting contracted to elevate the brow whereas the patient has ptosis which is because of the weakness of the levator palpebrae superioris and unilateral frontalis contraction like in this case is a clue that it is the lid elevators which are weak on that particular site uh, the symptoms uh, whenever a patient has ocular myasthenia could be ptosis and or diplopia myasthenic weakness that remains limited to the ocular uh, muscles in the first 2 years there is a 90% likelihood that the disease will not become generalized 10 to 15% of all myasthenia gravis in caucasian populations and about 50 to 60% of asian population would have ocular myasthenia the confirmation of the diagnosis is difficult because sometimes the repetitive nerve stimulation test the acetylcholine receptor antibody tests are negative single fiber emg is very very specific but it is very cumbersome it is very difficult to do it is done at very few centers and the technical difficulties involved in single fiber emg are extremely uh, big whenever these patients they try to open to close their eyes very very tightly then the eyelashes uh, they tend to separate and this is what we call as this peak sign in which when they want to contract the muscles very very uh, tightly they open up and this is called as what we call uh, the peak sign weakness is usually variable fluctuating and fatigable it shifts from one eye to the other which is almost pathognomonic sometimes you can have an ocular quiver in which there is a fluttering movement of the upper eyelid when you try to keep the patient looking up for a long time sometimes you might find a lid twitch you can also have pseudo internuclear ophthalmoplegia and uh, you can also find features like uh, uh, you know asymmetrical ptosis you can uh, cover one eye and the lid ptosis on the opposite side may be relieved whenever you cover one eye Uh, so when the ocular weakness is mild it might not be obvious on routine examination and it might appear only on provocative testing for example we can ask the patient to look up with a sustained gaze and gradually the upper eyelid is going to come down which we call as a curtain sign we can apply a ice uh, uh, wrapped in a handkerchief on a, or in a cloth on the side where there is ptosis and it tends to improve and the sense 
ACT test is almost like a repetitive nerve stimulation test, and it has been compared by some to as sensitive as a adrophonium test. Unfortunately, adrophonium is no more available in India, and therefore we can't use the adrophonium to test for ocular for pure ocular myasthenia. Now, why is that uh, adrophonium is useful for ocular myasthenia and not so much for limb myasthenia? Now, if you look at the structure and the function of the ocular muscles, that they are white muscles, whereas the limb muscles are red muscles. So why they are white? Because the eye movements have to be very rapid, very precise, and the amplitude of the movement of the eye is very low. So the eye muscles are very rich in mitochondria. So therefore, the junctions in the neuromuscular, uh, 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 sorry, the neuromuscular junction density in the eye muscles is very, very high. Therefore, short lasting drugs, they work better on ocular muscles as they work on the, as compared to the work on the limb muscles. So that is why if you have a patient with the ocular myasthenia, sometimes pyridostigmine, which is a longer acting drug, might not work so well uh, for the ocular symptoms, while it will work very well for the limb symptoms. And sometimes you might need to combine uh, pyridostigmine and neostigmine in the same patient if the ocular symptoms are not improving significantly. Facial muscle weakness is almost always present. And as I already told you, bilateral facial muscle weakness and uh, ptosis is very, very unusual in any other condition apart from myasthenia. Frequent choking and throat clearing is seen in patients if they develop, uh, uh, you know, bulbar features. The patients might observe a nasal twang in their, mus in their speech. They might have hoarseness of the, of the speech because of uh, evolving laryngeal muscle weakness. There's a difficulty in chewing and swallowing, and there might be a nasal regurgitation of liquids. There is isolated dysphagia or respiratory dysfunction. There might be very rarely isolated diaphragmatic paralysis as the only manifestation of uh, myasthenia gravis. Patients might only have orthopnea. I have had at least five patients who have presented to me only with orthopnea in a patient with seronegative myasthenia. So it is a very, very uh, dicey and a clinically demanding situation sometimes. So at rest, these patients appear uh, depressed. And when they attempt to smile, they develop what we call as a snarling facie. And that is what uh, we sometimes see as a characteristic facies in myasthenic patients. Patients might have respiratory muscle weakness. And this is because of weakness of the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm, which results in CO2 retention due to hyperventilation. And sometimes it may be a neuromuscular emergency. Never ever ignore a patient who has a, a bulbar weakness, because that is a very, very important indication that this patient is going to develop a respiratory muscle weakness. The weakness of the pharyngeal muscles may collapse the upper airway, and therefore we have to measure what we call as a negative inspiratory force, the vital capacity and the tidal volume whenever a patient is in a impending respiratory muscle weakness. Never ever rely on pulse oximetry and always resort to arterial blood gas uh, oxygenation uh, because uh, you might sometimes be misguided by a normal pulse oximeter. We should always look for coexisting autoimmune disorders like hyperthyroidism, which occurs in about 10 to 15% of myasthenics. And it is very, very important to identify such patients because the responsiveness to immunomodulation and the responsiveness to treatment will be not good unless the thyroid status is converted to a euthyroid state. Many patients would have associated rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, lupus, and hypervitaminosis B12 as pernicious anemia. Also, many, many uh, uh, case reports are now popping up of multiple neuroimmunological uh, disorders occurring in patients with myasthenia. Uh, for example, I have had at least two patients where there is a definite inflammatory muscle disease and a definite myasthenia coexisting in the same patient. So a very, very unusual combination, but that is possible. So uh, 
the proximal muscles are affected more than the distal muscle. So in the upper extremities, the deltoid are weaker uh, than the wrist muscles. In the lower extremity, the patients usually would complain of difficulty in getting up from a squatting position or from a toilet seat and in climbing stairs rather than a distal weakness uh, in terms of plantar flexors and dorsiflexors, which are relatively spared. Uh, this I think I have already taken out. But what is important is always look for neck flexor weakness. There are very few disorders in uh, neuromuscular disorders where you will find a neck flexor weakness. Uh, the most common causes are myasthenia, dermatomyositis and polymyositis, acute uh, inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy and CIDP, where you would have a neck flexor weakness, which is very, very routinely seen. If you find an isolated neck extensor weakness and you have a seronegative myasthenic, then always suspect musk positive myasthenia in these patients, particularly if it is a lady, particularly if it belongs to the African Asian community, and particularly if you find some degree of atrophy in the neck muscles, in the tongue muscles, and in the proximal muscles in the upper extremity. Uh, Sometimes uh, you can have uh, idiopathic myasthenia, but the, very rarely you can have some drugs which can cause myasthenia-like symptoms like certain antibiotics, beta blockers, lithium, magnesium, and particularly deep penicillamine, which can uh, cause some degree of neuromuscular blockade, and it can also worsen a pre-existing myasthenia. So differential diagnoses are several, but if you have a person who has a fatigable weakness, proximal muscle weakness, who has a facial plus oculomotor weakness, a patient who has diurnal variation of symptoms, who has switching sides, ptosis, who has fluctuating weakness, there are hardly anything which can, you know, confuse you in terms of the mentioned differential diagnosis. So diagnostic testing in terms of uh, identifying, there are several ways of going about it. If a patient has pure ocular uh, symptoms, then uh, ice pack test is a very, very good test, which you can very conveniently do in the OPD and get the results almost uh, straight away. And this is, as I've already told you, almost like a, a repetitive nerve stimulation test and sometimes to as good as the adrophonium tests. Then antibody detection. Uh, so you should always ask for uh, Estalcholine receptor binding antibodies, which are very, very common. Estalcholine receptor blonchic antibodies are seen in less than 1% of individuals. If a patient is seronegative, then you should go in for an anti-musk antibody titers. Sometimes you might have double seronegative patients. And uh, there are only two or three cases reported in the world where there are double zero positive patients. And we have one of those reports with us where there was one patient who had a double zero positivity. So practically it is non-existent. Uh, as I've already told you, adrophonium chloride is not available these days. One might require a neostigmine test. So you can evolve a set pattern in which you can ask a person to do number of sit-ups in a minute, an arm abduction in a minute, arm flaps in a minute, then uh, arm abduction time, and a breath holding time and a single breath count. So this is basically a type of uh, evaluation which you can do at the bedside for these patients. You do a baseline test, give injection neostigmine, uh, uh, preferably after a pre-medication with atropine. And if you are in the private sector, preferably in ICU settings, so that you can have a cardiac monitor at the bedside in case a cardiac arrhythmia ensues. And uh, uh, the, the neostigmine would start acting all in a few minutes. So you do the same set of evaluation after five minutes and then after 10 minutes to see the response of these patients. And this you can start working after, say, half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, you should always be careful about looking at uh, evolving bradycardia, fasciculations, and uh, excessive salivation after giving neostigmine. Electrophysiological evaluation is uh, required, and this is done in the form of repetitive nerve stimulation test. Uh, so this is the sensitivity of various types of evaluation strategies for myasthenia. Uh, 
In a generalized myasthenic, acetylcholine receptor antibodies would be seen in about 80% of patients. If it is negative, then in the zero negative, 40 to 50% would be mask positive. Repetitive nerve stimulation would be positive in about 75% and single fiber EMG 92 to 99% individuals. In ocular myasthenia, the sensitivity of any of these tests you can see is very low. Uh, so acetylcholine receptor antibodies might not be seen in 50%. Anti-mask antibodies are very, very rare. Repetitive nerve stimulation might be normal in 50% of individuals. So therefore, an ice pack test, a therapeutic response to the drugs, a challenge by uh, adrophonium or uh, neostigmine are more uh, important for ocular myasthenia as compared to the electrophysiological evaluations. Uh, I think physiology we can leave. Yes, so repetitive nerve stimulation is a test in which we record the C-maps during repetitive nerve stimulation of the motor nerve. And it is abnormal if repetitive stimulation activates lesser number of fibers. And it basically uh, is uh, seen because of progressive depletion of acetylcholine reserves. It is very important to have a very good quality of uh, recording. It is very important that you stabilize the muscles before you stimulate, because if you ask, if you allow the joint to be mobile, then you will never get a good baseline. And sometimes the response is going to be extremely erratic. So when you are observing the graph of a repetitive nerve stimulation uh, test, then always be very, very clear that the baseline does not shift up and down. Otherwise, you will get a false positive response. The stimulation duration is 0.1 milliseconds. The stimulation intensity is 10 to 25% above the maximal response. And therefore, one should always record a CMAP amplitude before a repetitive nerve stimulation. The limb muscles should be adequately warmed before we do this testing. So decrement is uh, best elicited at three to five hertz. Uh, at a higher stimulation, you will get a loss of decrement. A stimulation at a higher frequency would get a potentiation. Felicitation uh, marked in uh, presynaptic disorders. It is less in uh, myasthenia gravis and in itself is not a differentiating point. The area of the C-map remains relatively constant and only the amplitude increases, then it is a pseudo felicitation. It's not actually a true felicitation, which should be kept in mind. Uh, so the maximal decrease in C-map amplitude is seen between uh, second to fourth or fifth stimulation. Decrement of more than eight to 10% is important. If a patient has taken a drug, then this is going to be a false negative test. So the patient should be off medication for at least 12 hours before you do this uh, uh, repetitive nerve stimulation test. Then uh, there can be an induction of felicitation in which high frequency stimulation or voluntary contraction of the muscles for 20 seconds uh, causes a felicitation, which is then re-evaluated after some time for a post-activation exhaustion. So this is a complete repetitive nerve stimulation test and it should be done only in this way. Just testing for repetitive nerve stimulation and finding a decremental response is not the right way of reporting a repetitive nerve stimulation. Uh, I think uh, we will leave this because I don't have any personal you know, uh, experience on single fiber EMG. So I will not be able to tell you much about single fiber EMG, but I can just tell you the basic principle. So now this is the neuron and this neuron is supplying the impulse to several muscle fibers. So this is... Uh, this is a nerve fiber and there are several neurons in this which are having several neuromuscular junctions. So when an impulse arrives here, it is A, time A. And when it arrives here, it is time A plus 0 0.001 second. When it supplies here, it is B. And when it uh, arrives here, it is B plus 0 0.000 whatever second, milliseconds. So this difference in the time 
when the impulse activates different neuromuscular junctions is called as jitter. So this jitter is increased in neuromuscular junction disorders. So the impulse, when it is given up from the brain, then the timing of its arriving at different neuromuscular junction is variable. And this variability is high in patients with uh, myasthenia gravis. So this is the basic principle of single fiber EMG. Beyond this, I can't tell you much because I don't have a personal experience on this. Now we come to the treatment part of it. So there are four segment, uh, significant uh, treatment options. One would be a symptomatic treatment. Then there would be a drug modifying or a disease modifying treatment like immunomodulation therapies. Then treatment of myasthenia in emergency situation. And finally would be thymectomy. So estalgonine esterase inhibitors, as I've already told you, most commonly one which we used uh, use is paradostigmine. It lasts for about uh, three to six hours for its duration of action. Its onset starts 30 to 60 minutes after giving. So it should be preferably given empty stomach before the meal so that the patient can improve his following apparatus also. We should always be asking the patient to any to, to the development of any cholinergic symptoms like uh, palpitation, like fasciculations, increased salivation. As I already told you that for limb, pyridostigmine might be a good drug, but for eyes, it might not work in some individuals. So you can add a dose of tilstigmine, which is neostigmine, in between the doses of pyridostigmine. Then, then we come to the immunomodulating therapy. So Commonly, uh, the most common uh, drug which we use for immunomodulation in myasthenia gravis is prednisolone. There would be a very rapid improvement in these patients, but one should always be careful that steroids are never ever given in higher dosage. So you start low and go slow. The total dose would be one to two milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. But if you start in the steroids in a high dose, then these patients can trigger off a myasthenic crisis. Now, why this initial worsening is seen when you give steroids in a high dose? This is a very favorite question of the examiners. And it is very rarely that you will find it in books. Now, why this happens is that when you give high doses of steroids, then there are several mechanisms which act at the same time. First is that the release of estalcholine from the presynaptic nerve endings is reduced. The second is that the affinity of the estalcholine to the existing estalcholine receptors is reduced by high doses of steroids. The third is that the steroids when given in high doses have a potential membrane stabilizing action. And the fourth is that high doses of steroids sometimes might be associated with hyperkalemia which can cause uh, sorry hypokalemia which can cause a worsening of a pre-existing myasthenic situation so that is the reason why steroids should never be started in high doses in these uh, patients now those steroids are the most commonly used drugs for the management of immunomodulation in myasthenia but you'll be surprised that there are only two trials with only 37 patients, which were quasi-randomized. And this trial was done way back in 1976. So this is the only trial which exists for the use of steroids and myasthenia, whereas we use it every single day in every single patient. Other immunomodulators are azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, mofetil, which are the most used ones. Others are cyclosporine, tacrolimus, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, aculizumab. So, it's important that whenever you give these drugs, you should be careful and knowledgeable about their side effects. We, you again, you start low and go slow. For azathioprine and methotrexate, they are bone marrow suppressants and they're hepatotoxic. So you have to have intermittent evaluation of the liver function tests and uh, um, a hemogram. Mycophenolate is usually a very safe drug, but still you can have lymphopenia and you can have altered kidney functions. So these patients should also be evaluated by these tests. Cyclosporine, tacrolimus, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, these are reserved drugs and they would be required only in very severe non-responsive cases. So steroid side effects would be seen in all. Azathioprine side effects would be seen in some. 
you can do a tpmt gene mutation to uh, identify those patients who have a potential uh, possibility of developing a side effect like uh, uh, like um, bone marrow suppression to azathioprine and there you can use alternative measures you can give a folic acid as a supplement with the azathioprine uh, so every 15 days you increase the dose of azathioprine and then uh, observe how a patient responds so the best response which i find you will get by giving a dose of steroids the same time you can start azathioprine gradually increase the dose of azathioprine as well as steroids maintain a dose of steroids and the maximum dose of azathioprine after the azathioprine effect comes in sets in which would be usually in 2 to 3 months it is at that time you start tapering down the azathioprine and continue sorry st uh, start tapering down the steroids very very slowly never again taper suddenly and continue with the azathioprine alone as a immunosuppressant for a long time Uh, then there are several comparative trials as a thiopren has been tried with or without steroids obviously the uh, the the results were better when as a thiopren was combined with prednisolone uh, i think i will skip this so very recently there are two large uh, uh, retrospective studies both of this are from india one by dubey et al but the other by gupta et al and they have highlighted the steroid sparing effect of azathioprine but again it should be understood that uh, the effect usually starts in 2 to 3 months and i have already labeled the side effect which you uh, have to be careful about mycophenolate there are four trials which have evaluated the role of mycophenolate mopitril and myasthenia gravis uh, the two initial ones were only for 36 weeks and therefore they were negative trials the later ones which continued for more than 6 months showed a improvement and more than half of these patients were able to taper off the steroids so for expecting a good response to mycophenolate mofetil uh, you have to wait for even up to 6 months before you get a good immunomodulatory effect so don't give it up sooner the problem with mycophenolate is that it's a toxic drug there are several trials which are now evolving small case series which are evolving for the role of rituximab in myasthenia and the beat myasthenia gravis study which was a double blinded trial was not promising um, because these patients they did achieve a good b cell depletion but the primary outcome of inducting a remission were not achieved i use rituximab as a rescue drug in patients who have tried at least two immunomodulatory treatments in combination and have not found significant remission in their myasthenic symptoms there was recently a retrospective study from aims um, it was vinay goyal et al who had done this evaluation in which it was found to be effective in severe cases and they found that multiple doses might not be uh, needed to achieve a steroid free remission like in patients with the neuromyelitis optica so a single dose of rituximab might be able to achieve a steroid free remission which can then be maintained by alternative means like azathioprine or methotrexate so uh, it is entirely uh, to the treating physician but it should be used as a rescue treatment as not and not the first line treatment aculizumab is a c5 monoclonal antibody directed complement protein uh, so there is one trial uh, which we label as the regain trial in which severe myasthenic patients on steroids and had failure of two immunomodulators and were still having worsening of symptoms were given a 26 week randomized uh, this thing of uh, aculizumab and uh, it was a fda uh, approved uh, sorry it was a, a positive trial in which uh, the exacerbations of the disease were better uh, controlled in the treatment group but the risk of meningococcal meningitis were 2000 times higher in the group as compared to the controls uh, presently it has been fda approved in a resistant myasthenia grace there are several drugs which are in the pipeline rosanolexizumab uh, ifragatrimod uh, they have tried uh, completed phase 2 trials and phase 3 studies are currently underway uh, 
and the present trials have observed a 75% clinical improvement in myasthenia gravis ADL score in the sixth week period compared with 25% which is seen in the placebo. Now we come to the second component of uh, the treatment of myasthenia, that is myasthenic crisis, which is a life-threatening condition. It is defined as a weakness from acquired myasthenia gravis that is severe enough to necessitate intubation or delay extubation following a surgery or a stressful event. The patient, uh, by definition, requires to be on a ventilatory support in crisis, and there is a respiratory failure because of respiratory muscle weakness and or oropharyngeal muscle weakness leading to upper respiratory upper airway obstruction. About 10 to 20% of patients with myasthenia will have at least one episode of crisis in their lifetime. About 30 to 13 to 20% of the patients, the crisis can be the first manifestation of the disease. And annual risk of myasthenic crisis in patients with myasthenia is about 2 to 3%. Respiratory failure can be because of respiratory muscle weakness or oropharyngeal muscle weakness leading to upper airway obstruction. So this is basically a flow chart on the pathophysiology of myasthenic crisis. So these patients could have either a bulbar weakness or they could have a ventilatory muscle weakness or both. So whenever there is a bulbar weakness, there is accumulation of secretions in what we call as a oropharyngeal lake. And the alternative uh, mechanism and cuff and swallowing reflexes are depressed. There is then atelectasis, microaspirations, increased upper airway uh, resistance, and that leads to pneumonitis. And also simultaneously, there is hypoventilation, increased dead space, which leads to hypoxia and hypercapnia, causing a respiratory failure. The ventilatory muscle weakness causes a decreased tidal volume and a functional residual capacity, which again gets the same end results. And finally, both of these things together, they land this patient into a respiratory failure. These patients might have an increased generalized or bulbar muscle weakness as a warning. So whenever a patient has bulbar weakness, never ever ignore him and you consider it as an impending respiratory muscle involvement. And uh, in, in a report of 44 patients who developed 63 episodes of myasthenic crisis, the crisis began with generalized weakness bulbar symptoms or weakness of the respiratory muscles in 76, 19, and 5% respectively. Generalized meekness can sometimes mask the signs of respiratory distress and weak respiratory muscles may fatigue suddenly and can lead to a respiratory collapse. That's what I wanted to warn you against. There could be several triggers like concurrent infections, pregnancy, surgical intervention, high doses of steroids or sudden cessation or stopping of steroids, tapering of the immunosuppressive drugs or stopping of these drugs and several types of drugs. So this is a list of the drugs which can potentially trigger off the myasthenia. So whenever you discharge a patient with myasthenic uh, crisis or myasthenia who has been admitted under your care, don't forget to give them this printout and this they should carry with them to uh, all their practitioners whenever they go so that these drugs are not given to them by mistake. There are several warning signals like increased generalized or global weakness, reducing single breath count, breath holding time, the observation of the accessory muscles of respiration being used and uh, the appearance of bulbar features. So these patients have to be admitted to ICU. They have to be assessed for their respiratory function. We offer them an elective intubation, a rapid therapy, uh, immunomodulating therapy, careful weaning and manage the complications. So we, Admit every patient into the ICU who has features of rapidly increasing weakness, uh, secondary to an exacerbation of myasthenia. We frequently monitor these patients. And if a patient has symptoms of dyspnea, severe dysphagia with weak cuff and difficulty in clearing secretions, then these are signs of respiratory muscle weakness. And these patients would have a poor respiratory effort, shallow breathing and sometimes paradoxical breathing in which there would be indrawing of the intercostal muscles in drawing and a paradoxical movement of the abdomen and the muscles of accessory uh, inspiration like the sternomastoids would be markedly active. We measure the function, the respiratory functions of these patients of which tidal volume is a very, very important marker. And this tends to decide which are the patients who definitely would be needing uh, intubation. 
so we can uh, do a formal evaluation of vital capacity and uh, when the patient is in the icu it reflects the mechanical function of both inspiratory and expiratory muscle strength and it can be performed easily at the bedside some experts recommend assessing both supine and sitting vital capacity as diaphragmatic weakness is more apparent when a patient is in a supine uh, position now one thing which is evolving these days is evaluation of the maximum inspiratory pressure so what we do is that in this the patient is instructed to maximally inhale against a closed wall and the force and the pressure that is generated at the mouth is recorded so this inspiration is a negatively generating force and thus the values are recorded as a negative number and a maximal inspiratory pressure below 1/3 of normal it predicts a severe respiratory muscle weakness and probable hypercarbic respiratory failure whereas a uh, mip which is less than minus 60 is usually associated with a weak cuff only so the more it's negative the more it is going to be a problem so so these are the several uh, tests in uh, the myasthenia patient which indicate that when would be the criteria for intubation when would be the criteria for weaning in initiation and when would be the criteria for uh, extubation so the first vital capacity is less than 20 if the negative inspiratory pressure or the maximal inspiratory pressure is more then minus 30 if there is a positive expiratory pressure of less than 40 then it is likely that these patients would require um uh, just a second i have to take this call Uh, sorry so uh, these are the indicators when should you intubate when should you start weaning and when should you consider extubation am i audible you are audible sumit okay sir so ebg is definitely a better marker to evaluate these patients and one should not rely on spo2 during an icu stay which is uh, i have already told this and if a patient develops uh, you know progressive hypercarbic uh, respiratory acidosis despite therapy it may provide supportive evidence uh, that uh, we should uh, intubate as soon as possible we always intubate these patients uh, electively if a patient is into a myasthenic crisis and uh, the indication for intubation i have already uh, told you when we intubate these patients it should be clear that succinyl choline can be used but the dose required is high we do not use curaramimetic drugs and uh, this is basically more for the, the critical care uh, specialists where the type of intubation i have told i don't think it is important for uh, a neurologist um i have already told the reasons for elective intubation uh, non invasive ventilation is to be avoided that is very clear give these patients a drug holiday stop acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitor drugs because this will make the receptors hungry and when you uh, give these patients emergency medications like iv immunoglobulin or plasma exchange then uh, the receptors would become empty with the acetylcholine uh, antibodies and therefore the drugs will start having a good effect so normally we don't give any acetylcholine esterase inhibitors for about 3 to 4 days and uh, if there are too many secretions we manage it by giving glycopyrrolate we manage the infections and we start weaning as soon as possible don't be uh, uh, i would say don't be hesitant in getting a tracheostomy done for these patients because if you don't extubate them soon they would become ventilatory dependent very fast and therefore 
it is imperative that uh, the critical care team which is taking care of the myasthenic crisis patient is very very uh, you know uh, congruent with you on this topic and they are energetic in getting a early tracheostomy done because our target is to achieve as much of a respiratory support with as little chance of development of uh, dependency on ventilator as possible sometimes when we give too much of drugs they might develop a cholinergic crisis which resembles to myasthenic crisis but uh, this is a way by which you can differentiate that and this is basically you can take a screenshot to differentiate this now which is the drug which is to be given then so uh, there are several trials which have evaluated the role of iv immunoglobulins there are trials which have evaluated plasma exchange now what you do will be dependent upon the policy of your particular institution so if you are working in a <clears throat> private sector things are different if you are working in a government sector things are different both these modalities have been found to be equally effective in treatment of myasthenic crisis the important point is that plasma exchange has got its own side effects in the form of hypertension arrhythmia to be avoided in <coughs> older individuals ivig at the most can cause some degree of uh, hyponatremia it can cause some degree of uh, headache it can cause some uh, adverse drug reactions in terms of skin uh, eruptions but otherwise they are both almost similar in uh, their efficacy so it will all depend upon whether the plasma exchange is to be paid for by the patient or it is not for example if you are in a academic uh, government institution the plasma exchange machine is that of the hospital the technician is that of the hospital the only thing which the patient has to buy is a plasma exchange equipment whereas in a private sector the patient has to pay for every single thing he will be paying for the rent for uh, the drug he would be paying the room rent charges he would be paying for the perfusionist so in a private sector a single plasma exchange costs about 60 to 75000 rupees plus the bed charges the iv immunoglobulin for a single day for a 50 kg individual would cost about 1 to 1.25 lakh rupees in a private sector so the cost of both the modalities is similar in a private sector and actually plasma exchange might be slightly costlier because it has to be done alternate day as compared to ivig which can be given over a matter of 5 days so while i personally prefer plasma exchange more over intravenous immunoglobulins but in the private sector i counsel them in a way that both of them are similar your choice is more directed towards the side effect profile and the age of uh, the individual who is being treated so we give usually 2 to 5 days of uh, iv immunoglobulins usually you give it for 5 days now there are no rules for plasma exchange plasma exchange can be continued indefinitely in patients with the myasthenic crisis and i have done up to 18 plasma exchanges in my patients who have had a resistant crisis which does not respond to treatment and the symptoms of the patients do not improve however uh, in general usually 5 to 7 plasma exchanges are different are uh, usually effective there are several trials where the type of plasma exchange has been evaluated the mechanism of access has been evaluated the filtration technique has been evaluated the daily versus alternate day has been evaluated low versus high dose has been evaluated most of these trials are almost similar in their efficacy so any modality of plasma exchange which is good in your particular institution is good for your patient so uh, ivig there is only one uh, randomized control trials the total number of patients is you can see only 87 plasma exchange i have already told you <clears throat> there is hardly any this thing but there are uh, no randomized trials and at best there is class 3 evidence but still a level 2 uh, recommendation so uh, the volume which you have to remove is about 50 ml per kilogram exchange and uh, as i have already told you 14 exchanges people have done i have done up to 18 in selected individuals and so this was our own publication in which we compared the low dose daily versus alternate day plasma exchange in severe myasthenia gravis with the crisis and we found that actually the duration of stay of patients with daily 
plasma exchange was shorter as compared to alternate day plasma exchange. Uh, and uh, therefore it might be cost effective in terms of efficacy, both of them were found to be equal. So there, this is not uh, in uh, the stage of recommendation as yet, but this is the evidence which is very much there. Side effects of uh, plasma exchange, I've already told you. So uh, which one of the two you do is basically on counseling of your patient and your comfort and the comfort of your institution and of course the cost. So after you have given the immunomodulation and the patient has uh, been uh, on two to three days of immunomodulation with the plasma exchange or IVIG, that is the time when you should add acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. I have already told you the criteria for weaning. And uh, once you have met these criteria, then you start weaning and never be very, very energetic in extubation because reintubation causes more complications as compared to delayed extubation. Yes, but be energetic in getting an early tracheostomy done so that uh, the ventilatory dependence is, uh, you know, uh, as little as possible. And then we come to the final component of uh, treatment of myasthenia, which is thymectomy. Now, it was one of the controversial part of the management of myasthenia gravis management. And uh, the trials of thymectomy are almost as old as anti-estalcholine esterase inhibitors in the management of myasthenia. It continues to be a debate regarding the indications, the efficacy and the timing and the type of surgery. Uh, till uh, the November of uh, 2016, where New England Journal of Medicine published its first randomized control trial, which found that there was a modest benefit of uh, <coughs> thymectomy over prednisolone alone. I was supposed to be a part of this trial where John Newsom Davis way back in 2005 contacted me for uh, evaluating these patients in the trial, but unfortunately he met with an accident and he eventually died. Uh, and therefore this trial took a backseat and I was not being able to be a part of this trial. So this is basically the history of thymectomy in myasthenia. So 1941, when the first transternal thymectomy was done, we are now in that era of robotic thymectomy, which is a very, very good modality. Now, the problem of thymectomy in literature till now was basically because most of these studies were non-randomized, uncontrolled and retrospective. There was a lack of standardization outcome variable. There were non-standard definitions of remission and there were use of crude outcome rates instead of survival techniques. So there are very few trials which do that. And there were variable rates of follow-up, variable adjuvant treatments. So it was a non-homogenized data, which was evaluated in a non-randomized fashion in a way that the results which came out were evaluated in what was not needed. So Basically, this is probably the first, uh, you know, uh, systematic review of about 21 studies which were controlled but non-randomized and crude or corrected remission rates were eventually analyzed. So what is important is that these were very short studies, but it was important is that seven out of these 15 studies describing medicine-free remission showed a significant positive association between thymectomy and a better outcome. Eight of these 12 studies describing asymptomatic patients on and off medication, there was a significant positive association between thymectomy and a better outcome. And what was most important was that there was no study with a significant negative association. The people who improved the most were those who had generalized myasthenia, those who had relatively severe symptoms, those who were males, I'm sorry. just a second, sir. I will just take yeah. a 10 second break. Yeah. 
the results were not so good in ocular myasthenia in patients who had mild symptoms. And therefore, the subgroup which looks the most attractive for myasthenia would be those who are seropositive, who have had the disease within the two years of doing thymectomy, those who have generalized myasthenia, and those who are less than 65 years of age. And the absolute indication for thymectomy is a thymoma. So whether it is an ocular myasthenia or a non-myasthenic individual, if you have a thymoma, then that is an absolute indication for thymectomy. So this was basically the most important trial, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, where the positive patients, uh, zero positive myasthenics, 18 to 65 years of age, disease duration three to five years, and MGFA uh, clinical classification of uh, second to fourth stage. The outcome measures which were evaluated were, were the QMG score, which is the quantitative myasthenia gravis score, and the required dosage of prednisolone over a course of three years period. And uh, in this trial, over a period of three years, which assigned to the thymectomy group fared better in the QMG score by a factor of three as compared to the prednisolone group alone. The requirement of prednisolone was also lower in this group, and there were no significant difference in the complication rates. So that was the first question, which has probably been answered that uh, there is very little doubt now that thymectomy should be offered to all individuals who have a generalized myasthenia, which is seropositive, if they are relatively stable and within the first two years of the onset of the disease, if they are less than 65 years of age. <clears throat> Then what is the type of surgery? Now, there are several types of surgeries, but what is more and most important is that the extent of removal of, I will show you that paper. Um, yes. So it is basically that you can do any type of surgery, but your surgeon should be capable enough of removing every single tissue, which you call as thymus. So that is the most important. And there are several techniques which have been uh, I think there was a slide which I think I have deleted by mistake. Okay, no problem. Anyway, that's not important. So what is important is that this is an important thing. So this is a cervical plus sternal approach, which we call as the maximal thymectomy. This is the videoscopically assisted thymectomy. This is the sternal thymectomy. So you can see that the best tissue removal is the cervical and sternal removal. And this show the best response rate over a period of time. And this was by Jaritsky et al, who did this review of 17 studies. So the target is that as much of tissue in that thymic area should be removed as is possible by a surgeon. If he is good at doing it by transsternal route, it's fine. If he is good at doing it by videoscopic route, it's fine. If he is doing it by a robot, it's fine. So, uh, as I've already told you, it's the treatment of choice for thymoma, regardless whether the patient has myasthenia or not, type of myasthenia or not. And it is now evolving as a definite indication of thymectomy in generalized myasthenia. And these are the patients who will have the maximum benefit, as I've already told you. Ocular myasthenia, uh, I would not do thymectomy unless and until there is a thymoma associated or the patient is non-responsive and has significant disabling symptoms. Seronegative myasthenia, uh, not justified to do thymectomy unless and until you are pushed to the wall because it has been found in several evaluations, of course, non-randomized, that uh, the risk versus benefits are not in favor of thymectomy in seronegative myasthenics. Uh, in old age, the thymectomy is not advisable because of the associated comorbidities, but you can still go ahead if symptoms are not responding. Children, we have had, uh, uh, this, this was our publication in which we operated upon nine patients with juvenile myasthenia gravis, which were subjected to VATS. There was a mean follow-up of 2.3 years when it was published. There was an improvement in about 60 to 70 percent of individuals, but there was no side effect observed in terms of decreased immunity or increased infections. 
uh, because of removal of the thymus in these patients. Old individuals, I have already told you, it might not be a good drug. So again, in order to conclude, I still remain at the point where I started my discussion on thymectomy, that all thymomas, all myasthenia gravis with thymomas, and it might be of benefit in seropositive old, uh, individuals less than 65 years of age with generalized myasthenia, less likely to be of benefit in others. So what is actually the thymic area? So everything which is medial to the phrenic nerve on the left side and the phrenic nerve on the right side. So anything medial to this and anything which is below the thyroid notch up to the diaphragmatic anterior mediastinal diaph uh, ligaments up to the posterior extent, which is the large vessels and the heart and the pericardium. So everything which is in this a zone, thymus gland, the perithymic tissue, the fascia, the soft tissue, everything which is in that area should be removed. And why is it so? Because though thymus is only this much, there is actic th ectopic thymic tissue, which is left behind and this can cause a recurrence of symptoms. So whatever the way your surgeon chooses, it's fine. So this is how we go in for a robotic uh, insertion of three ports and we can take it out very easily by doing a minimally invasive surgery. And this is what I follow these days with my interaction with Dr. Arvind Kumar in Gangaram Hospital. So he has been my uh, thoracic surgeon for thymectomy for the past, I think, 18 years now and we have had uh, uh, together a uh, association of more than 450 plus thymectomies which is probably the largest in India. So this is in nutshell uh, about the management of uh, myasthenia gravis in terms of uh, the symptomatic treatment, the immunomodulation, the role of thymectomy and the management of myasthenic crisis. So now I will very, very briefly in two slides um, end my presentation by giving you a capsule of musk antibody positive myasthenia. So 50% of anti-acetylcholine uh, antibodies negative generalized myasthenics would have a, a, a musk positive myasthenia. Uh, it is geographically closest to the equator that you will find maximum of these patients. It can be seen in any age, but usually not beyond the middle age. It is very, very common in females as compared to males. Usually the cranial and the bulbar musculature is uh, very commonly affected. You will find very marked atrophy of the tongue muscles, the facial muscles, the neck extensors are very, very commonly affected as compared to the flexors. And the electrodiagnostic modalities are very limited. The repetitive nerve stimulation test is usually negative or it might have equivocal res response. The single fiber EMG might or might not be useful. Muscle biopsy is usually normal. There are practically no changes in the thymus which are observed and therefore the role of thymectomy is not good in these patients. They also respond very poorly to acetylcholine esterase inhibitor and they show a dramatic response to plasma exchange and uh, corticosteroids. They will require a very long-term efficient immunosuppression. So this is basically a classical presentation of an African lady where you will have a very mild ocular and facial weakness with a significant uh, atrophy of the tongue muscles. Uh, repetitive nerve stimulation is positive only in 50%. Single fiber EMG may show NMJ involvement. EMG might show myopathic. The neuromuscular junction <coughs> shows a less uh, severe pathology as compared to myasthenia gravis. Often only partial improvement is seen and residual symptoms are uh, present in these patients. Plasma exchange can be offered for crisis. Uh, Pyridostigmine is usually not beneficial. Thymectomy, I already told you, is not beneficial. There are evolving roles of uh, rituximab as a drug of choice for anti-musk myasthenia. 
So these are the results of multi-center prospective randomized control trials, where 119 patients uh, over a period of 10 years from different centers were evaluated uh, for the role of rituximab on these patients. There were 77 of these patients who were evaluable, and it resulted in a class four evidence that rituximab might be better than other immunosuppressants in musk positive myasthenia. So this is uh, uh, everything about uh, myasthenia gravis, which I can bring to you. And this is my team. Oh. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you. You have done an excellent job. You talked about excitatory contraction coupling to so many things about clinical lessons are muscle weakness in musk positive cases. And you highlighted the style receptor, uh, receptor antibodies, that especially the block binding type, which we have to do. And you also highlighted on repeated nerve stimulation test and sensitivity. And you at length discussed IV, IG, plasma exchange, and all the other drugs. And it's a very lucid lecture. I hope all the students are benefited. If there are any questions to Dr. Sumit, will you please put up those questions and you can ask. And uh, Sumit, uh, one thing I wanted to ask is that at, uh, uh, before thymectomy, you always do uh, remission with IVIG or plasma versus? No, uh, it is never, uh, nev practically never it is required. I okay. What I do is that uh, if a patient has, uh, say, significant bulbar weakness, significant yeah. uh, uh, swallowing difficulty, significant nasal regurgitation of fluids, yeah. in those patients, I would try to bring in a remission first and then offer them thymectomy. Yeah, but yeah, there would true. be some patients who would have thymoma. So in those cases, uh, urgent surgery is the best option for them. So in those cases, I do give them a remission by giving IVIG or plasma exchange before surgery. But otherwise, I don't offer it as a routine. Uh, one more thing we would like to um, clarify from uh, AIMS teaching to all these boys, boys is, uh, it's a uh, thymectomy recommended for all the myasthenia gravis cases who are generalized less than 65 years. And there is a concept that it should be done only if there is a thymoma. No, there many a time I came across this type of suggestion from cardiothoracic surgeons also, but there is no thymoma. Why do you want to get it done? So that we should insist that it should be done whether there is thymoma or not. And the indications Dr. Sumit has mentioned. What do you say, Sumit? You also yes, face absolutely, sir. I am a very, very strong proponent of thymectomy. And. Uh, I know how much uh, uh, struggle we had to undergo to get the time yes. when we were there in Ames. Yes, <laughs> and yes. The, so, sir, after you left, uh, then we had a tie-up with the Professor Arvind Kumar from okay. the surgery department. Yeah. And he started doing videoscopically assisted time to me. Oh. And then we had no problems at all. To the tune oh. that the cardiothoracic surgeons, mm. they started feeling a little, you know, shaky. <laughs> and they say that you don't send any thymectomy ke liye patients. Why don't you send any more patients to us for thymectomy? So we said you were you were acting so smart, you were acting so uh, important <laughs> and pricey. And now Dr. Arvind Kumar does two thymectomies every week, so our patients don't have to wait. Because you remember our patients had to wait for yes, yes. three, three, four, four days, bed yes. occupied. Yes, yes. Then they would operate and send it back to us. <laughs> yes, we have to manage. <laughs> you have to manage. So that thing got completely over and it was a very, very, uh, you know, nice experience. And we switched over to robotic thymectomy in 2006. Okay. Okay. So that time Dr. Arvind did the first, uh, you know, workshop on robotic thymectomy when robot was brought, the Vinci robot in Ames. Mm -hmm. So the first workshop he did was uh, uh, nine cases of which six cases were mine. Oh, nice. Yes. Uh, another thing uh, somebody is asking is what will be effects on thymectomy, on immunity and whether COVID or hepatitis E will be aggravated? No, actually there are hardly any changes which are observed in thymic tissue yeah. after adulthood. So its role in adults as an immunity modulator is questionable. So oh, in oh. younger individual also, I have already told you that this was my publication where we had nine patients who were all juvenile and mm. they also did not have any increased incidences of any types of particulate or non-particulate infection in a 2.3 two, two years of follow-up. Excellent. 
So another thing which you clarified is very good that endrophonium is not available. Though we have done a uh, number of times endrophonium tests. Of late I have not done. I think last about it used to cost 5,000 rupees and we used to buy one while and yes. keep it yes, for sir. number of patients. Yes, <laughs> so sir. That's yes. good. Now it is not available at all. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Sumit. I think that now we'll close because uh, uh, there are no more questions and we really enjoyed the talk and we'll have more occasions to have you around. Okay. Anytime, sir. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Have a good bye. Day, evening.